here with us today at City Hills. We are glad that you are here. We're so glad you're here. Well, Christmas Mall, what a weekend. What a weekend. Thank you for everyone who served at the Christmas Mall. Thank you to uh, just, thank you City Hills for being a generous church uh, that loves our community, that makes a difference uh, in the lives of people. It's so exciting and it's, it's, it's exciting to be a part of. I don't know if you feel that way. I feel that way. And I just love you so much. I love our church family and uh, thank you um, for just, um, loving God, loving people, um, it's making a difference in so many people's lives, and I just, I just love and appreciate you so much. Uh, if you have your Bible, uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 1, and we're in a series right now uh, called Here to Worship, and we're looking at a life of worship, and as you turn there, you can also follow along with the digital message notes as well, just point your phone at the screen, but as you turn there, I want to make mention of a couple things coming up in church life. I cannot believe it's already next Sunday is going to be um, a City Hills Christmas, and this is our big Christmas uh, weekend, Christmas experience, and really, it's geared toward inviting someone to join you next Sunday and Saturday. So, so we have services, two on Saturday, Saturday at 5 and 6.30, and then Sunday at 8.30, 10, and 11.30. So it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to bring somebody with you and, and to share the message of hope, the message of Jesus and uh, let us know when you're going to come, uh, RSVP at uh, cityhills.com right there on the homepage and let us know uh, how many's coming with you and, and let's, just, uh, let's just see people come to Christ and hear the message of Christmas. And then um, on December 25th on Christmas Day, we always take the last Sunday of the year and we, and we make it an at-home worship experience. We call it Sabbath weekend, Sabbath Sunday and uh, that's going to be that weekend. So we have a special Christmas at-home worship experience that will be streaming all day at our normal service times and then on demand for the rest of the day for you to join in with us. And my, my prayer and hope is that the whole family just kind of joins together. And um, it, it's, it's actually going to be from our house to, uh, to, to, to your house. So it's going to be a really, really special, special time on the 25th. So we won't be having any in-person services on that day. And then um, on the 8th of January, we have our 21 days of prayer and fasting that kick off. And so if you haven't been a part of that, maybe you're new here, maybe you're newer at City Hills, um, what that looks like, we actually gather here for those 21 days, Monday through Friday at 6 a.m., and there's worship and teaching, and then uh, Saturdays at 9 a.m., and it's just, it's life-changing. And then our Sunday service times are at our normal times, but it's just life-changing as we seek the face of God. And so if you're, if you're new and you haven't experienced that, go ahead and mark it down to be a part of that. It's going to be a great time, and, uh, and I'm, well, I'm so glad that you're here today. If you're new, if I had a chance to meet you, I'd love the opportunity to. But let's dig right into the Word today. I want to kind of look at the Christmas story from a little bit different vantage point this morning and to look at actually kind of the beginning, the, the preamble, if you will, to what's going to come um, as we look next week at the birth of Jesus Christ we're going to kind of look at the beginning of whenever God spoke to a couple uh, through an angel in Luke chapter 1. Let's look at it together. Luke chapter 1 in, in verse 5 says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth, verse 6. And they were both righteous before God walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they had no child. But you could insert whatever the impossibility is that we all face. They're, they were serving God, but there was an issue. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Verse 8, now while he was, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty... According to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord to burn incense. This was a type of worship, to burn incense in the temple to, as worship to God. Verse 10, and the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled. And I'd say amen to that. I'd be troubled too. Ze Zechariah was, this was unexpected. He was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. 
But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. How many are thankful that God's word of us not being afraid? Sometimes when God's moving in our lives, we have fear, and, and, and it's okay. God says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm leading you. It says, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Verse 15. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Verse 16. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Verse 18, some great marital advice. Verse 18, and Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? Watch this. For I am an old man and my wife is advanced. (laughs) Hey, that's good marital advice right there. For all the men, I'm old, she's advanced. (laughs) Just saying. (laughs) These two people in the Bible here were waiting. They were waiting for a child. They were now older and had been praying for a long time for something to happen in their life. They're waiting for this promise to come. They're waiting for a baby. But but more than that, they're waiting for the Messiah. They were part of the nation of Israel who were waiting for the promise of the Messiah to come. And this was something that really is what the Christmas story I was thinking about when it comes to worship and whenever it comes to all the things that we uh, celebrate here in the Christmas season. Christmas has so much to do in the Bible about waiting. I feel like the Lord just kind of brought that to my attention, all the different aspects of the Christmas story and how waiting is involved in it. Pregnancy, there's waiting. Not only that, There was a waiting from the first moment the Messiah was promised to redeem the people of God until he came. Actually, the third chapter of the Bible has the very first promise about the Messiah coming. After Adam and Eve sinned by listening to the devil, God comes in, gives them, he covers them and says, there's coming a day where the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of this serpent right here. And then nothing happens. And then all throughout the Old Testament, there are these prophecies, these words that, that, that God's going to come. We, we're reminded of them all throughout the Christmas season, like the book of Isaiah, that, that there's one coming, Emmanuel, God with us, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. There, there's all these promises, but after the promise, there's silence and nothingness. And, and I really came with a burden on my heart to share with somebody, to encourage just the church family or maybe just to encourage one person. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but somebody who God has given you a promise. You you know God wants to do something great in your life or you have a prayer that you've been praying or a loved one that you've been praying for or or, or a tension in a relationship or in your marriage or, or a relationship that you want and here you are again, single again or something you want fixed or mended or a promise from God. You're like, God, I got a Bible verse for it. I'm standing on this promise, but it looks like it's not happening. It looks like there's no progress between God's promise and the fulfillment. It looks like there's nothingness. And and, and you feel like you're in the gap. You feel like you're waiting. I came to really preach to that person today because here's the truth. None of us like waiting, do we? Not at all. I mean, I've never, you know, been with you know somebody before and like there's a waiting line at the doctor and they're like oh I've been looking forward to this I, I, I cannot wait I came just excited about this or, or, you, or you go to a theme park and it's like man I just hope there's extra lines I'll wait in the longest line I'll pick it on purpose and I want to walk in that line no we hate waiting my kids they have no concept of waiting and 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 they keep asking for things like right now, like just two days ago, my son was asking me for something for Christmas. Well, no, for something, just a, a game that wasn't cheap. And he said, can I get this? I said, no, son, Christmas is only a couple weeks away. He said, dad, that's forever away. 
<laughs> and we don't like weighty. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't like weighty. We don't do waiting well. But there are certain things we can only learn in the waiting. Isn't that true? That kids have to learn the difference between the words no and not yet. And, and, and the, the more immature you are, the more you can't tell the difference between no and not yet. But the more mature we are, we trust that God's delays are not necessarily his denials. I was thinking so many of the problems that I face in my life uh, have to do with the fact that I'm not good at waiting. Think of the problems in our world today because we're not good at, at, at waiting to delay gratification. We want what we want right now. Think about debt. It cause, it's caused because we don't want to wait till we have the money for something. We, we just, we want it now. You think about the uh, immorality. You think about the, uh, the, the diseases the, the, that, that have come into our world because of people uh, not waiting until marriage to have sex. You think about all of the different things that we just don't want to delay gratification and, and we want it when we want it. We, and we, if, if we could get God anything, it would be a wristwatch, right? It'd be a wristwatch. God, I want you to do what I want you to do and I want you to do it on my timetable. And, and it's hard when we wait. I was thinking it's like if you've ever waited for someone while they're having a surgery the, the thing that's so miserable about that is you don't know what's happening. And so you're just waiting for that phone to ring so you can pick it up to find out, okay, the surgery hasn't started yet. Or you're looking at that board to see kind of where they are. And it's in the silence that you're full of fear. In the silence, there's so much anxiety. But, but here's what I want to do today. I want to show you what the scripture says is what's ha what is happening in the waiting seasons of life so that we can value what God is doing, but also... I also want to share what we can do in the middle of the waiting season. Because I, I was thinking about this. In the Bible, the, the, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the last book of the Old Testament is the book of Malachi, and the first book of the New Testament is the book of Matthew. The distance in my Bible between those two chapters is, okay, that right there. That's the difference between the Old Testament and and the New Testament. But it hit me this week is that there were 400 years. What we can turn a page with like that, it took 400 years for the people of God to be able to turn that page. 400 years of silence. This is what you call the intertestamental period, the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it was actually silent for 400 years. No recorded miracles, no prophets preaching about the Messiah. It's as if the prophetic word of God about the redemption of Israel and the promises of God just hit the pause button and nothing happened for 400 years. I'm sure the people thought, God, what have I done? God, do you not love me? God, did I make, what did I do? Did I make a mistake? Have I said the wrong thing? What have I done? What can I do more? And, and it looks like there's just nothing from God. Now, I really dedicate this message to somebody. You feel like you're in the middle of some silent season. You're in a silent season in your walk with God. You're like, Brandon, I'm here. I'm at church, but I just don't feel like God's saying anything. You know, people are like, praise God, I'm doing good today at church. And you're like, if you were honest, you're like, I feel like God is a million miles away. I don't know what's really happening. I, I, I know all the Bible verses. I know all the songs. But, but, but I, if I'm honest, I feel like God is just quiet right now. If you're taking notes, I just have some truths I want to share, and I'm going to share some application at the end of this message. But here's the first thing I want to share. Just because God feels silent does not mean he's absent in your life. Just because God feels silent does not mean he's absent. We see this in this time, in this gap that, that the Messiah is coming to these people that are in a silent season. In Galatians chapter four, gets us a little bit of context to this. It says this, but when the right time came, speaking of when Jesus would come, when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could could adopt us as his very own children. But the, but, but the part of this verse that sticks out to me, if you could go back one verse to verse four, it says, but when the right time came, 
God may have looked like or to the people have been silent, but God was waiting for the right time. And with a little bit of hindsight, we get to see the why behind the wait. And, and you, could, you, you could go with a lot of different things I'm about to share here in a moment. But I, I was, I, my, my, my mind was kind of awakened to what happened in this intertestamental period, now this Christmas season, whenever you just think about, God, why were you waiting? Why the 400 years of silence? If you're into history at all, this may be fascinating to you. But, but here is just a list of a couple of the things or five things that was happening um, in the waiting. Do I have that list of the five things that were happening in this 400 years? So it looked like it was silent, like nothing was happening. But here are just some things that were happening in history. Alexander the Great conquered the then known world. And because of that, Greek, for the first time since the Tower of Babel, there was a common language of, of the majority of people on earth. And that time, because of the common language, the Old Testament was translated into Greek in that common language. So now the common people could, could, could understand what God has been doing since the beginning, since Adam and Eve, they had the Old Testament. Uh, in this same time period, the Socratic method was being taught or embraced. And what that meant is that teaching was no longer just a one-way um, event, but you could actually ask questions and you could, you could challenge and you could um, it, it, it engage the learner uh, to, to really engage the depth of their mind to process ideas. The Romans who conquered the world at the time, they were, they were in control in this 400 year period. They began to build common roads so that for the first time in history, you could travel all over the then the, the Roman world. And then the fifth thing that happened was something called the diaspora. And I'm not sharing a lot of history. This is fascinating to me, though, because the diaspora was something that because of the Roman occupation and all the things that were happening in the world, the Jewish people actually dispersed all throughout the then known world. These people that had the knowledge of what God had done, these, these, these people who would then after the gospel would come, they would understand the promises of the Messiah and they would then have churches and all the things that would happen. So, 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 just, so from an outsider's perspective in the middle of, in, in the middle of it all, it looks like God's being silent, silent, but the truth is God is waiting for the perfect time. So there can be one language so people can hear the greatest news ever told so that, they're, so that they could understand what God has been doing so that they could, that he was about to answer the question that everybody was gonna ask and, and there were gonna be roads so that the gospel could travel around the, around the world and then there would be people that understood what God had been doing so that when they heard the message of the story of Jesus, they could then take it to the then known world. What I'm just trying to show you just a little snapshot of history is that God's silence does not mean he's absent. He could be just waiting for the perfect time to do the miracle in your life because God has a purpose in the waiting. God has a purpose in the waiting of it all, that there's a reason. Here's another truth today. Not only when, when, when God's silent, he's not absent. Here's another truth. While you're waiting, God is working. While you're waiting, you say, Brandon, I'm waiting on somebody. I'm waiting on this. I'm waiting on this situation. I'm waiting on this miracle. I'm waiting on this fulfillment. I'm waiting on this to happen in my life. I'm waiting on this promise to come to pass. While you're waiting, God is working. God is working behind the scenes. He's doing it at the, he's preparing you for what he has prepared for you. He's preparing the situation. He's letting things be ready. While you're waiting, God is working. I love this. I put it in your notes. Five truths about God's perfect timing. This is from Pastor Rick Warren. God has a timetable for everything that happens. It's just good truth. But God does not tell us the details in advance. Amen. Anybody have a testimony about that? Yeah, I don't know all the details in advance. Here's another the third truth. God is never in a hurry, but he's never late. Number four, God's timing is not always convenient. And number five, I love this one. At the right time, God can do anything instantly. At the right time, when the time is right. So don't give up. Keep trusting. Keep believing. At the right time. You say, Brandon, I'm getting so far behind. Brandon, it looks like what, what, 
what, what is happening in my life, it looks like it cannot happen. The time has passed. Well, I want to tell you, you're talking to the one who invented time, that, that God can turn water into wine. I, I love that, that, that uh, miracle, for Jesus' first miracle in the New Testament. Not only was it a miracle, but it was a miracle of time when you think about it. Because to turn water into wine, and not only would it take a miracle in the moment, but, but for it to be good wine, it would have to be fermented, and it would have to take time. It would have to take a long time. And here's what the Lord can do. If you'll trust him, he can make what would, take, what would have taken a long time be done in a moment if you'll keep trusting him in the waiting because he's in control. And so back to our text, Luke chapter 1. This 400 years of silence, of looking like nothing's happening, culminates. This fires me up. Culminates in an angel speaking to a man named Zechariah who had a wife named Elizabeth. This is breaking the silence, if you will. 400 years, nothing. And God breaks the silence with Zechariah and Elizabeth. Why Zechariah and Elizabeth? There's so much meaning. The Bible is so full of meaning. The Bible is so full, it's like a diamond. It's so full of revelation and, and hope. And this, this just encouraged me all week long. If you're taking notes, Zechariah, this is no coincidence. Zechariah, here's what it means. His name means God remembers. <laughs> Isn't that good? And Elizabeth means God's promise. How does God break the silence of 400 years when it looks like he's doing nothing? God breaks it by saying, I want you to know, I still remember my promise that I gave you. That, that my silence has not meant my absence. And while you've been waiting, I've been working. And if you put the Christmas story in a nutshell, here's what it would be. God always keeps his promises in our lives. God always keeps his promises and he always does the right thing. God remembers his promise. Let me speak that over somebody's life today. God remembers his promise in your life. God remembers. You don't have to make it happen. You don't have to figure it out in your own power. God remembers his promise in your life. Can we just give God a hand clap of praise here at 830 on a Sunday morning? Just give God thanks and praise. God remembers his promise. He remembers his word. Can I tell you, God's, God's word has never failed. And he's not about to start failing with your life. God's always been faithful. So what do you do in the waiting? I want to show you from the life of Elizabeth and Zechariah. What we do in the waiting seasons of life. And if you're waiting in some area, let this be an encouragement to you. So what do you do in the waiting? Three things to do in the waiting. Number one, trust God in the waiting. Trust God in the waiting. Trust that God is working Trust that God is doing something good. Trust that God is orchestrating it better than you can. Trust that his way is actually better than the way that you've devised. Some people, from time to time, they get upset whenever, maybe you're here and you're bitter at God, if you're just being honest. You're like, God, you failed me. God, you haven't done something the way that I felt like your word said. God, and, 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 and you have really let me down, God. Can I just stop right here, here and encourage somebody? Don't stop believing yet. God's timetable is bigger and more overarching, and it goes all the way to eternity. That you can trust that God is doing the right thing. Say, why does God do what he does? Why does God wait the way he waits? Why does God let things happen or not let things happen? Here's, here's what I was thinking. God makes the decision you would have made if you would have understood things from his perspective. That if we could see our lives and the world and other people's lives from God's perspective, we would understand that he's only doing things for our good and for his glory and that he has a good plan in it all and he's doing something good and you can trust him. Isaiah 64 and verse four says this, I love this. From of old... No one has heard or perceived by ear or no eye has seen a God besides you. Watch this promise about the Lord who acts for those who wait on him. 
God is in the business of acting on the behalf of people that say, God, it takes humility to wait on God. It takes humility to trust the Lord, especially in the society we live in today because we think we can do a lot and we can figure out a lot and we can manipulate a lot and we can think a lot. We can get on Facebook and see what other people are doing and try to catch up our lives to them and say, well, this person's doing this. I'm gonna do this. This person has this house. I'm gonna get this place. This, this person is doing it this way. Now my life's gonna do it this way. And we get ourselves in a world of trouble when we try to, we, we try to manipulate God's promise and saying, God, I'm gonna help you speed up what you want to do in my life and we see this all throughout the scripture this is what happened with with, with Abraham that's why he had an Ishmael whenever Sarah tried to s- figure out how to do God's plan on her own I want to encourage somebody today just trust that God is doing something good and don't get ahead of him one moment God's answer may be not right now trust his timing Trust, just, just give it to him. Live with open hands. God, I want you to heal me today. I feel like I have a scripture that promises your healing, but God, however you want to heal me, I'm good. However you want to do the miracle in my life, I'm good. If you want it to happen in my lifetime or not, I'm good. I just trust that you're doing something good. I, I'm, I'm going to trust the timing of God. Here's the second thing we need to do in the way. Not only trust God in the waiting, Number two, grow in the waiting. Grow in the waiting. Could you say that with me? Grow in the waiting. I put this in your notes. Who we become while we wait is as important as what we're waiting for. I got a question this morning. Who are you becoming right now? You becoming bitter or better? You becoming faith filled? Are becoming negative, s- cynical? Are you becoming soft-hearted? Are you becoming hard-hearted? Are, are, are you becoming pure and honoring God? Are you becoming self-centered? Are you becoming generous? Are you becoming stingy? What, 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 what are you becoming? When you look at Zechariah and Elizabeth, We see in verse 6, it tells us about their life. We we read it earlier. It said this in verse 6. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. That's incredible. Because here they were in a season where nothing was happening. 400 years of silence. But I love it. In the midst of the silence, there were still people that said, we're going to serve God in the silence in faithfulness to God's commandments. You know, I, I don't need to feel God to do the right thing. I don't need to feel God or, or hear God the way I want him to for me to just be faithful to God and for him to grow me into a righteous man or woman or young person or to, to say, God, I'm gonna do what it is you've called me to do. It doesn't matter. I've made a decision to grow. I've made a decision to be who you've called me to be. If you're in the waiting room, you're in great company because people throughout the ages, saints of old, I was thinking about Abraham waited 25 years on God's promise. Joseph waited 23 years from the dream that he had to the fulfillment of the dream. David waited 15 years from the time he was prophesied and anointed to be king before he actually got on the throne and actually fulfilled what God had already anointed him to be. It took time. And not only that, Noah, he built a boat in the middle of the waiting for 120 years. You're in good company in the waiting. Who are you becoming right now? Here's another question. What are you learning right now? Good challenge. Write down, before the day's over, write down what you're learning right now in the waiting. I did this this morning. Whenever I got here a little bit early, I was thinking about this message. It was and, and I, I started, I just, I just took out a post-it note and I wrote down a couple areas of my life where I'm just waiting on, on the Lord. And I always said, okay, Lord, these are areas I'm waiting. What am I learning? And what I realized just in just that one little exercise, God began to bring truth of what he's, be, what he's building me, what he's doing in me, what he's doing in my life. Because while I wait, God is working. And he is working not just wanting to do something through my life. He's wanting to do something in my life. He's wanting to, me to become who he's called me to be. I think about Paul in prison. That's how waiting feels like, in prison. We feel like we're stuck. 
feel like we can do nothing. Paul's preaching the gospel, doing the right thing, and he's stuck. But in this stuck place, he doesn't say, woe is me. God, you failed me. God, you haven't done what I said, what I thought you were gonna do. God, I'm out here planting churches. God, you owe me. But what does he do? He gets out a, he gets out a piece of paper and starts writing the book of Philippians. Count it all joy when you fall into, try. he writes, he, 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 he begins to write about the joy of the Lord. He begins to write the, the letters in the gospels and the, the letters of the epistles. That, that changed our lives, changed the church. That, so, so here's, a, what's God teaching you right now? I'm not trying to make light of the waiting season you're in, but what's God teaching you right now? Don't, and I'll say this, don't let the devil keep you in the past for one moment. You say, Brandon, I've blown it. Look at what I've made. I'm waiting because I've, I've blown it because I haven't been leading my family right. I haven't been doing the right thing. You know what? The devil wants to keep you locked in your past. God's bringing you forward today. He says, my promise still stands. Here's the awesome thing about God. His promise still stands even though we make mistakes. You talk about waiting. God is so patient and how he waits on you and me to be ready to fulfill what he's called us to do. Here's the third thing. So trust in the waiting, grow in the waiting. Number three, worship in the waiting. Worship God in the waiting. We read that in Luke chapter one, verse eight, that here, here uh, Zacharias, he enters the temple. This was the Old Testament temple before the resurrection of Jesus, before we're, we're worshiping a risen savior with the revelation that we have of what God's done. But he was in his own way, faithfully worshiping God. And I, and I love what verse 13 says. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Watch this, for your prayer has been heard. In other words, he was praying. Worship in the waiting. Pray in the waiting. I wanna commend you for being at church today. If you're in the middle of the waiting or you're watching online, you're in the middle of the waiting season, I commend you because as we worship in the waiting, God does a miracle in our life. As we worship in the waiting, God does awesome things as we fill the empty voids with God's word, with worship, with prayer. Here, I mentioned it earlier about waiting uh, at a hospital, but the silence is where the enemy works in our lives. It's in the waiting. It's in the silence where the enemy says, God's forgotten you. God doesn't care. I was <laughs> thinking of this. If Satan had a, uh, a tagline or like a mantra, a slogan, a motto, it would be this, you're all alone. that's what the enemy lies to you and me about all the time. You are alone. Nobody knows. Nobody cares. You're all alone. But when we worship, it fills the voids with the truth of who God is. I, I want to tell you, worship can get you through the most difficult moments of your life. I look back over my own journey of the last 20 years of serving God, and I think about the highs and the lows and the opportunities to worship God. I think about the, we, we, were, we, were ter, we were told about two years into our marriage, Kara and I, we've been married, next month will be 17 years. We were told a couple years into our marriage that we wouldn't be able to have kids. And I just remember the blow that that was. And I remember going to church after that and standing in the, uh, in, down front in the altar and just lifting up our hands together and just worshiping God. God, I just worship you. I'd love for you to change that, but, but God, I just, I want to worship you through it. And I think about, we were able to, she, she, she got pregnant and then we lost, we lost the baby walking through a miscarriage. She was living in, we were living in Florida at the time. She was in Florida and I was on a work trip in Austin, Texas at a church conference. And I get the call while I'm at this church conference that she was experiencing a miscarriage. I didn't know what to do. I was in the middle of this church. I'd never been in this, this conference. All I, I, I walked down this hallway and I found the, the, a, a private little bathroom kind of in the back. And I, I went in there and I got in the furthest stall and I got down on my hands and knees in that bathroom in Austin, Austin Texas at this church. And I kneeled down and I worshiped God. 
said, Lord, I don't understand it. It's not what I wanted. But God, you've given, you've taken away. Bless me your name. I worship you here in a place I don't want to be. But God, you're good. And we worshiped as God brought us our oldest son. And we worshiped through difficulty and other miscarriage. We, 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 we worship God through the waiting, knowing that he is faithful and he is good. And I just want to encourage somebody today, until God opens the door, I love this statement, you can worship God in the hallway. You can worship God between the doors being open. You can worship God in the difficult places. You can worship God when it looks like everything's not working out because he's faithful and he's good. If the enemy's if the enemy's motto is you're all alone, then God's motto is I'm with you. We're taking notes today. Here's, here's the last and final thing I wanna say. So powerful. While we wait on God, we wait with God. Isn't that good? God's not just the doctor in the waiting room, doctor in the surgery room doing the work. He's also the friend that sticks closer than a brother sitting out with us while we're waiting. God's not just the one doing the work and out we're here, we're all alone. No, while we wait on God, we wait with God. And he is with us in the waiting. Matthew 121, this is the promise of Christmas, 122. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear forth the son and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. I'm with you. And then you flip over. That's the beginning of Matthew. This blessed me. I want to show you the last verse in Matthew. It begins by saying God is with us. Here's how it ends. Matthew 28, 20. And behold, I am with you always even into the ends of the age. It begins with I'm with you and it ends with I'm with you. In the beginning, they were waiting on a Messiah. Can I tell you to come? We're waiting on the Messiah to return and he's still with us in the waiting. He's with us while we wait. And I'll conclude with this last and final scripture, Isaiah 40. I thought this was so powerful. Why don't we, why don't you, wherever you are, why don't you just kind of close your eyes and I just want to speak this over you from God's word. I pray you don't hear it just as me speaking. I pray you hear God's voice speak to you today. It says, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is discarded, disregarded by my God? In other words, God, why are we waiting? God, you don't even know where I'm going, all the things we feel in the waiting. And here's God's response to what? To the waiting seasons. Verse 28, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to them who have no might, he increases strength. For even youths shall faint and be weary and young men will feel exhausted. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's my prayer for you today. Let me pray for us today. What's God saying to you through this message? I know it's for somebody in this house. Maybe I'm just preaching to myself, but we all, have seasons in the waiting. But God said, I'm Emmanuel. I'm with you in the waiting. So worship me because I'm faithful and good and I've not left you alone. Lord, I just pray for anybody here today in the middle of the waiting season. Anybody here today who's been feeling like giving up. Anybody here today who's been through trauma and pain and grief and sadness. Lord, and today your truth is just coming alive in their heart. God, I pray today, Lord, that, that, that the enemy does not take any territory back from what's being spoken today. I pray this will be marked in the, in the, in the hearts of believers all over this place, God, that we would know that you're faithful and know that you're good and you're doing something good through it all. While we wait, you work. 
and you do the best work, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Nobody looking around. If you're here today and you feel God calling you, drawing you, and you say, Brandon, I, I'm not right with God. I've been doing life my own way. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I don't want this service to end without giving you an opportunity just to do that, to surrender your life to Jesus, to begin again, or maybe for the first time. I invite you to pray this prayer of surrender with me, a fresh start with God. Let's pray this together. Say, Jesus, I surrender to you. My whole life is yours. I give you my mistakes. I give you my hopes and dreams. I give you the challenges that I'm facing. I give you my whole life. Save me. I believe you're the son of God, Jesus. I believe you died for my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I choose today to surrender. I choose today to trust you. I choose today to follow you wherever you want me to go. My whole life is yours. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Lord, thank you for what you're doing today all over the house. In Jesus' name.